welcome to Ron Hasn't Seen. I'm Ron, and this channel is dedicated to me cataloging my journey through a bunch of movies I probably should have seen a while ago, and just for some reason or another, have never seen. Right now, I'm in the middle of a musicals run, and today we're going to be talking about Chicago. Chicago is a 2002 Best Picture winning film by Rob Marshall and written by Bill Condon. It's based on the Fred Ebb and Bob Fosse 1975 musical, in turn based on the 1927 film, in turn based on a 1926 play, in turn based on actual murder cases. It stars Renee Zellweger as Roxy Hart and Catherine Zeta-Jones as Velma Kelly, with Richard Gere as Billy Flynn, Queen Latifah as Mama Morton, and John C. Riley as Amos. In addition to Best Picture, it won Best Supporting Actress for Catherine Zeta-Jones, Best Art Direction for John Muir and Gordon Sim, Best Costume Design for Colleen Atwood, Best Film Editing for Martin Walsh, and Best Sound for Michael Minkler, Dominic Tavella, and David Lee, and received seven other nominations. The story follows two women on Murderous' Row in Chicago in the 1920s, and their trials for the murders. Velma is a cabaret lead singer who shot her husband and sister when she found them in Fragante Delecto together. Uh, she's arrested in front of her audience while she's singing with Roxy Hart in attendance. Roxy is a wannabe singer who will go on to shoot her lover after he confesses that he's been lying to her about getting her a singing career and he's really just done with the affair and going back to his wife and kids. The two women are vying for press attention as well as the attention of their lawyer Billy Flynn in a way to manipulate juries into finding them not guilty for murders we know they committed. But despite their guilt, Flynn eventually gets both women acquitted by discrediting the DA by having Velma falsely testify about a diary entry she forged for Roxy. After they're freed, the two women reluctantly form a double act, uh, and they attract a lot of attention and become a big hit that way. And John C. Riley is Amos, which is Roxy's husband, despite having paid for her defense and paid for her attorney. She lies to him that she's pregnant through the whole thing and then, you know, just dumps him right after the trial's over and she's acquitted. Chain of Adaptations ends back at Maureen Dallas Watkins' 1926 play based on stories she filed as a reporter for the murder cases of Beulah May Anon and Belva Gartner. Uh... They're the basis for Roxy and Velma, respectively. A non-story really does mirror Roxy's a lot, including dumping her husband after the acquittal, but Belva's main inspiration appears to just be the fact that she's a cabaret singer. The original play has been retitled Play Ball, as to not be confused with the 1975 musical when it's put on today. But that musical was not that well received, um, but Bob Fosse was working on a film adaptation at the time of his death. There was a Broadway revival in 1996, which was much better received and kind of served as the inspiration for this. This was Rob Marshall's feature directing debut, and he would later go and direct a lot more musicals, Nine, Into the Woods, Mary Poppins Returns, and currently airing the live-action Little Mermaid. He also did Memoirs of a Geisha and the fourth Pirates of the Caribbean movie, so he's kind of all over the place. Um, I really admit I didn't know much about this movie and probably had a lot of it confused with Cabaret, and I think a chorus line, until just a few years ago when I went to see Cabaret on tour and kind of cleared up all these things. Most people know All That Jazz as a song, but it was really some of the Todrick Hall parodies of Cell Block Tango that kind of put this film on my radar more to be something I wanted to see. Those parodies were super well done and super entertaining, and then made me watch a video of the real song, and that really made me want to see this. And this kind of goes into what I've talked about before with diegetic music scores in musicals. And I think this had an interesting device that put it on the far end of the spectrum from the diegetic music. Like on one side you have things like Footlight Parade, where the musical numbers are musical numbers in the movie. They're rehearsing or putting on these stage shows. Then you have The Sound of Music, where people acknowledge that the characters are singing, but it's not always on stage. And then you have the more mainstream things like, say, Grease, or like Les Mis or Phantom, 
where the other characters don't actually acknowledge that people just broke into song and dance, but they understand the conversations, and it's used to advance the story in that way. But in Chicago here, most of the musical numbers seem to be more fantasy-like or daydream. A few of them do go into, you know, actual performances, but they seem to be, even in that case, the fantasy versions of the performers in their heads. Um, it almost serves as a narrator than a character's discussion. And it moves the story along for us, but it doesn't move the story along in the movie too much. It just It's a good way to give us background knowledge like we were reading a novel. And it works well in what would be a heavily choreographed show. I mean, it's a Fosse show, so yes, it's going to be heavy on that modern jazz dancing. And I think that really played well for a lot of these things here. Uh, I liked a lot of the numbers. I mean, Amos is Mr. Cellophane and Billy's Razzle Dazzle. Really highlight that omnipotent narrator. While you kind of get the mix of the fantasy and the performance song with nowadays Hot Honey Rag as the finale that Velma and Roxy sing together. Um, I thought all the numbers are visually stunning. Taking them out of the real world and putting them into these fantasy sets allows them to stand out and not be hampered by reality almost in the opposite of what i was going on about in fiddler and my fiddler on the roof in my review of that where i felt the musical numbers were weighed down by them trying to be grounded this just throws them out and makes them stand out and this is more of what i think of as a musical i, I enjoyed the plot i think it was simple i think it conveyed some truth to it it shows the public interest in these gruesome cases, which, you know, someone who grew up, like, in high school in the OJ era, you know, this is something that hasn't gone away. I mean, we still are fascinated by these trials. I mean, look at the documentaries on Netflix and all that. My wife watches these murder cases, like, constantly. And this movie really speaks to that, and I think that's one of the things that draws people to it. Uh, I think it's a well-made film. It's the first musical in, I think, I'm trying to do the math in my head, like 35 years. Uh, I think Oliver Twist was the last one to win Best Picture before this. So this really did set off a modern era of musicals that I think we're still kind of in. And some of them are hit or miss. Even with Rob Marshall's work, I love the Into the Woods show. The play did not succeed, or the movie did not succeed in conveying what the play does by some of the choices to make it that they use to make it a film. This worked, on the other hand, because I think, well, I haven't seen the show, but I think it translated well by being able to take a grounded situation, taking those fantasy things out to be the narrator, when I think one of the pro biggest problems with Into the Woods was they took out the narrator. So yeah, I really do recommend this. Um, it might not be everybody's cup of tea, especially if you don't particularly like musicals. But it's got it's entertaining. It's well acted. Uh, all the women, uh, particularly, were great. It was supposed to be a little bit of a comeback for uh, Richard Gere, which I'm not sure that continued on. Um, I know he hadn't been in a lot as a leading man before that because he was kind of aging out of that. Uh, kind of sex symbol leading man role. And he played he played Billy Flynn really well as the attorney. Um, and then seeing John C. Riley in something like this one, I think of him more in the, those Will Ferrell comedy things or you know stuff like that. I think this showed another side of him that was really good. Uh, so that's my review of Chicago. Um, I'm going to be wrapping up a couple more episodes in this musical's run. Uh, I'm not sure what's going to be next, uh, just scheduling-wise. I've already seen the two next ones, which will be Once and Guys and Dolls. I did Guys and Dolls is supposed to be first on the list, but I'm not. I'm having one of my friends come on to review with me, so I'm not sure about the scheduling. Once again, thank you for watching Ron Hasn't Seen. Uh, please like the video, subscribe to the channel. If you have any comments on things uh, you think I should see, check out my letterbox. Ron Hasn't Seen is... Uh, my account, you can see what I've seen, what I've watched for the channel, what I've watched this year, things I want to put on the channel. And if you think there's things I need to watch that are kind of out there, you know, as 
cultural touchstones that I might have missed, please let me know. Uh, once again, thank you for watching Ron Haven't Seen, and I'll talk to you next week.